So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about a very important concept in biology, but one that seems to frustrate people really fast, and that's the process of evolution. So you're gonna have to forgive me as I go through here that I just have a partial screen of the OpenStax Concepts of Biology um, slideshow, uh, because there's a number of other slides that I want to um, point out as we go along. So um, evolution is widely misunderstood, even by people that um, teach science, people that identify as um, science people. It actually has a large number of myths and misconceptions that are perpetuated even in the educational community. And this ends up creating some falsehoods out there and then people that have a hard time with evolution have easy targets to shoot at because um, there's, there's these incorrect um, things that are being taught about it. So as we go through this, we are going to be clearing up some of those and getting back to some basics on evolution. I'm gonna be pointing out some things. So one of the first things I want to point out is that some people um, confuse like learned behaviors or adjustments that you've made or an animal or a human or plant has made um, that's not in their genes. It's just an adjustment or a learned behavior to help them deal better or cope with the environment. Um, so for example, um, some, some nurses, might work really late and then they have to sleep in the day and be awake at night or um, people that get more used to being in a really cold area they get used to it over time where at first it was just really cold to them and then they started to not be bothered by it as much or increasing um, or decreasing the ability to sit and pay attention, like maybe your attention span goes up or down as you have to concentrate more or like maybe it goes down as you start playing like fast paced video games or something like that. Those are all like alterations or adjustments that you're um, that you one might go through, but those aren't um, linked to your genes and therefore they aren't passed down um, genetically to the offspring. Um, so evolution, what it is in biology, is it means that populations, and let me see if I can go to a more exciting slide while I look at this, okay. So it means that populations adapt to changing environment environments through natural selection. So they are organisms that are changing a little bit through natural selection that the um, best suited will survive and reproduce the most. Um, evolution in biology also means that there's changes in the allele frequency in a population over time, meaning the genes, the amount of genes of a certain gene increases or decreases over time in the gene pool and that gene changes, those gene changes, can eventually lead to whole new species. So those are the three main points that you really need to understand about what, bio or what evolution means. So humans can sometimes cause um, artificial selection in um, gene pools. And artificial selection means that we, we artificially cause an evolution or a change in a gene pool. Like sometimes we might um, overbreed or underbreed certain traits that we want or don't want to see. This happens a lot in livestock and in agriculture. So we might prevent certain animals from breeding that we don't want their genes pass on or we might overbreed certain ones that we want. We might breed um, certain um, plants or like actually crossbreed or make hybrids of plants um, that we want to work on. So humans can cause for sure evolution, which is a change in the allele frequency 
um, in a gene pool, and that is called through a process called artificial selection, where we're kind of forcing it to happen. So just a brief background. Um, remember that evolution is the change in heritable, that means inherited traits, over time and that that is pushed or driven by natural selection. So I'm sure you have, well, hopefully you have maybe seen these birds before, but um, I want to go in first. Actually, before I do that, I want to go into um, Lamarck. Okay, so Lamarck was an early scientist. His name was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and his um, theories were totally discredited, I believe, in the 1800s. Yet, we have to be really careful in science because I still hear people um, talk about Lamarckism-like things today, even though this, this idea was totally discredited of, you know, a couple hundred years ago. So I don't want you to look at the bottom because that doesn't apply. I only want you to look at the top giraffes here. Lamarck believed that a single giraffe in its lifetime, that's why it's labeled A1, A2, A3, that if the leaves were up high, that a single giraffe in its lifetime could stretch and stretch and stretch and eventually get its neck to be tall enough to reach the plants and that then that giraffe would end up having babies with longer necks because that's what was needed. Um, and that is completely false. Like I might be able to, if there's fruit up higher on a tree, I might be able to fix my posture and even maybe get a couple inches even taller by improving my posture and um, by standing on my tippy toes and stretching and everything. But it's not like I actually gained actual height potential there that's going to be passed on to my children over time. Um, so that didn't change me. Now, where do I hear about this um, in, in everyday language and talking to people? Well, I actually am one of the poor and fortunate people of the world that has like oily hair. And because of this oily hair, I, I have to wash my hair every day. And if I wash it every day, it looks great. And if I don't, then it's oily. And I have had so many friends over the years tell me, well, you just need to stop washing it every day. And then slowly you won't, your body will adjust and not make oils anymore. And then your hair will not need to be washed. You can wash it just once a week. Okay, this is Lamarckism. Um, so I usually ask people after that, like, oh, do you wash your hands every day? And they'll say, yes. And I'm like, well, after you wash your hands, do you occasionally put on lotion? on your legs or on your hands, and they'll often say yes, and I'll say, well, you need to stop adding the lotion, because eventually your body will just get used to the washing, and it'll make its own oil, and you shouldn't put on chapstick or anything else, because, because your body will just adjust and start making its own, like, oil on your hands and legs and chapstick, and it's, that's not correct, but it's one of those evolution, it's like a misconception and it's tied back to Lamarckism that I still hear people making today. So another evolution, oh, I have this, okay. Another problem is this um, picture. So I actually did not mean to go to this picture yet, but this was a picture made called the March of, progress. You can look it up if you're interested in it. But um, it was made by Rudolf, Rudolf Zalling, Zallinger, and I, I apologize for saying that wrong. Um, but this person, while it was well intended, um, this was a very bad um, representation that is not correct. And it actually doesn't show anything correct about evolution. None of these... Um, different animals prior to um, Homo sapiens in this picture. None of these are even direct ancestors of humans. These um, 
many of them weren't even cousins, um, like not, you know, like on a tree. So this was just a completely confusing picture in ways. Um, what's confusing about it? It acts like man is this final pinnacle creature. Um, it, it almost suggests to people that we came from greater apes. Um, and so people will say often say, well, then those shouldn't be around anymore. And I get that argument. Um, it's been drawn a large number of ways and it's got so many problems. And one of the problems like having man as the very end, it kind of assumes that we are the top end all be all creature of this whole thing. And man currently is having changes in the gene pool right now, which means man is currently evolving. And so to act like this is the end or like evolution is trying to get to this place in the end, like trying to get somewhere, all of those are misconceptions that we'll talk about over time. And so anyways, this was totally, this picture was totally discredited. You can le read it here, but it's one of those things that I think people that think they identify as science people will put it on the back of their cars and will like wear shirts with it. And um, I can't mock it too much because uh, my son is in robotics and I actually have one that goes to like humans to then robots. Um, but so even I've done that before, but it's, it's incorrect. Okay, um, so Darwin, he was um, uh, one of the early people that worked really well in evolution, and so was Alfred Wallace. So Darwin, as you know, he went to South America, Australia, Africa, and the Galapagos Islands, um, lots of other places too. He kept extensive like journals and writing and drew tons of good pictures. He um, took a lot of animals out of the wild to bring them back to England either as specimens, that means they had died, or as living creatures to put in zoos. Um, normally animals aren't taken out of the wild like that in good um, AZA types of approved zoos anymore, uh, but at the time, that was a normal practice. And Wallace had traveled to places like the Amazon um, and through like Malaysia. So they both did a great deal of work. Well, um, Darwin noticed when he was in the Galapagos Island, the variety of finches and their beaks that were there. And so here's this tiny little group of islands. It's like, go down to Ecuador and then go out into the Pacific, like hundreds of miles, if not more. Um, it might be a few thousand miles. And there's this tiny little set of islands. And yet here were all these different types of birds. So it's not like they could have come from the mainland. There was like one set of birds and yet it kind of gave rise to all these different varieties. And so um, let me see what I have here. Oh, okay. So I have some pictures here of all their different um, beaks and uh, what it looked like, um, different choices that are there. And so if you look at their different beaks, some were fruit eaters, some were insects, some were cactus, um, and some were seed eaters, and they had all these different types of beaks. Um, so he made the assumptions that um, these must have been related at some point. So Darwin developed his theory of natural selection. So there's a few parts to this. First, the characteristics of organisms are inherited and passed down from parent to offspring. So um, your genes is what's controlling or giving rise to something in the next generation. And then the second part of natural selection that was so important was that more offspring are produced than are able to survive and that the resources are limited. And so you have to compete in order to have some resources. So um, it's not like everything is going to survive. There's a limited amount and, and groups are going to have to find ways to get what they need to survive. And the last one is offsprings vary in their characteristics. So they're not all identical. So 
the most important part is that there is variation in genetic traits and some of those are just better for survival than for others okay now for two organisms to be um, considered the same species there's a few different um, definitions of species but one of the most common ones to use is the um, is the offspring um, is that if two animals can or plants can breed and produce fertile offspring then um, they are the same species so I had some pictures that I brought up here that I wanted to show you okay this is called the Pidsley bear or the griller bear and I'm sorry for this one I'm not sure if that one was killed or if it was just like um, like just sedated so they could do some work on it but this is as um, the polar ice caps are starting to melt which is where polar bears live and grizzly bears like it cold but not freezing the grizzly bears have started to move north to colder places and the grid or the polar bears are starting to move down um, because they can't go as far out into the ice caps this is making an overlap of range for um, polar bears and grizzlies and so this species of like a pizzly bear or a groller bear um, has started to be seen and it's kind of interesting because hunters in some places it's illegal to hunt a polar bear and in some places it's illegal to hunt a grizzly bear and so some um, hunters have actually gotten in trouble with this because if they kill one and it's part you know both um, they can they can get in trouble for that so um, this kind of bear it can reproduce and make fertile offspring so that kind of lends to the thinking that polar bears and grizzly bears are of the same species and you know there's some talk around that but it's looking like the polar bear is a subspecies of the grizzly bear but anyways you'll see that move on over time then you have other hybrids like um, the tigon or the liger and um, it depends which one is, you know, if the mom's a female or the mom's um, a female lion or a female tiger, they're, they are like very different based on what, which um, species the mom was. Now, this animal is not um, fertile. The babies are not fertile. And so they, these two are not the same species. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back to this slideshow. Um, so basically um, Darwin and Wallace, they ended up writing a lot of papers that have helped us understand um, evolution over time. So um, individual differences with a genetic basis lead to variation in successive generation. So genetic diversity in a population comes from two main sources, mutation and sexual um, reproduction. So a mutation basically is one that affects the phenotype of the organism, but basically a mutation can affect um, the organism and make it less fit or a mutation can make you more fit, but the large majority of um, the large majority of mutations actually make have no no effect on the organism whatsoever. It doesn't make it more or less fit to survive. So most mutations are end up being somewhat meaningless. Okay, so. Um, there's a word that I want you to, a couple words I want you to look, know, and one is um, convergent evolution. So when there's similar structures but in totally different species, and the common uh, example is like the wings of, of bats and the wings of insects, 
these are called analogous structures. So um, basically they have this a similar function and appearance, but they don't share the same origin like a common ancestor. So um, that's called analogous, analogous structure. So no relation to each other, but they, uh, they share a common ancestor. And it doesn't look like I brought up any pictures for you on that. So you will have to look that up. Um, the next one that I want to talk to you about is called homologous structure. And that's when two different species have similar structures, but they serve completely different functions. Um, and they do have a common um, ancestor. So your book gives the example of an ostrich and a hummingbird. Obviously, hummingbirds with their wings are so fast and nimble. And then an ostrich, the wings are nearly like useless. They use them for battle and to scare things away. Um, so they, they don't have the same function. So homologous traits are similar anatomy and genetics, which are evidence of a common ancestor. So the examples could be um, the bat's wing, a whale's flipper, human's arm. This is a type of convergent evolution, but with analogous structures. Okay, the next term, well, um, I'm not quite ready for this picture yet, but um, in modern, the, um, I want to point out something in your book um, states is about the modern synthesis of evolution. And the modern synthesis, remember to synthesize is to bring together, is really bringing out and highlighting that evolution now is really genetics combined with natural selection. Um, that it affects a population's genetic makeup because of pressures in the environment. So only some things are going to survive and reproduce. Um, and that gradual evolution of populations occur over time. Now, some evolution can happen actually really quickly. And we'll talk about that too. Like if there's suddenly a, a, a huge quick change, that can sometimes cause... Um, evolutions where there's like, for instance, a massive die off all at once. Okay, so I want to give you the example of, oh, here was the picture that I, I did have, see? Okay, so these are analogous structures right here where they're all shaped the same, the same type of shape, but they serve different functions. And let me see. Oh, okay. And these... I'm so sorry. I should have known that I had these, but I had them out of or order. These are um, homologous structures. So basically it's the same bones, but just in different orders. Um, but it shows a common ancestor. So the next story that I want to tell you about is about the peppered moth. So I'm telling you the peppered moth story. The pepper moth story is, I think, way overused and <laughs> overshared in biology. But just in case you have not heard it before, um, in, in Europe and during the Industrial Revolution, there was a moth. And the moth had both a lighter variety and a darker variety. And the trees before the Industrial Revolution tended to be like this birch tree and lighter and so it was really the lighter moths here that could hide on these trees really well and camouflage and not get eaten by birds okay and here's a somebody's drawing of a bird eating it okay and and here's a bird eating it so um after the industrial revolution there was so much soot and um, debris added to the air that these um birch trees their white bark was completely covered with like black um, soot. And now it created a situation where the black, um, the black peppered moths had an easier time hiding than the light peppered moths. And so um, there became this total like shift where it was the light um, peppered moths that were getting picked off from the birds. So this is like a called like natural selection. It's like it's pushing the genes 
to one side. So where, where um, a, originally, because they matched the bark, the lighter peppered moths were the most common ones. And I, only occasionally there would be some dark moths born and they would usually not be able to survive to reproduce because they would get picked off by birds. So they just were not very common in the population. Um, but after the Industrial Revolution, since these guys were all getting picked off, these guys were able to breed more and um, it caused this shift. So there's a few drivers um, that push a species to one side or another like this. Um, one is natural selection. We've already talked about that. We've already talked about mutations. Um, a mutation cre creates one allele out of another and changes an allele's frequency in a small but kind of continuous way, like very slowly over time. Um, the next one here is called genetic drift. And genetic drift causes um, random changes in allele frequencies when populations are small. Um, and genetic drift is pretty important to evolution. Another example of genetic drift is like, say there were a lot of um, snapdragons. Snapdragons, say there's three colors, a white, a pink, and a red. So say most of the field is pink and some of it, a good part of it is, is um, white and then there's just some red up across the way behind a rock. Okay, then say a fire comes through and the fire burns out most of the pink and white. Um, but now there's a few, few pink and white left, but all of the original red what is left because it was behind the rock and it didn't get burned. So in that case, that scenario, now the frequency of red genes is a lot higher where maybe before it was 1%, now say it's like 35%. So it changed the frequency, therefore an evolution occurred in that example. Um, so that can be like small groups. Um, sometimes it can be bigger groups. So migration in or out of a population is another way that gene frequency can, cha can change something. If I come into that same field and I'm like, what? We need more red. So I just move in a bunch of um, seeds from red snapdragons, then that is going to um, cause a lot more red um, red snapdragons to be there. Or say um, if an area does burn down and all of the animals that were there kind of move into the neighboring area, suddenly they're going to bring their gene pool with them and that can change the gene frequency too. Um, one more thing that I want to mention, and we'll talk about it more later, is another thing that can cause an evolution is um, non-random mating. So if we all completely, every species just randomly mated with, with another in, of the same species, then it would be a little bit more even that way. But we don't. The majority of, uh, not the majority, a lot of species actually have what's called sexual selection, where they actually select um, other mates that they want to reproduce with. So I wanted to show you a picture. One of my favorite um, is the fiddler crab. So the fiddler crab um, has this massive, this massive um, claw, and the males will actually um, show off this claw, and they'll grow it sometimes bigger than the whole rest of their body, and they make this little house in the sand. And the female fiddler crabs, she's really picky. She will go around and she'll look at their claws and then she'll crawl into their holes. And she'll do that all day until she finally finds one of the males that she likes his claw and she likes the little house he's built. And then she will mate with him. It's actually a funny thing to see on the beach if you've ever watched these guys in tide pools. Um, but... This is the case of, of non-random mating, of being um, sexually selective and actually saying, well, I want traits or genes like this. Well, I like your song or I don't like 
the, your song if you're a bird or I like your feathers or I don't like your feathers or I like this nest you made or I don't. Um, those all play into um, kind of disrupting regular population genetics. So it's not something that you can perfectly calculate every time because you don't necessarily know um, which which mate this female um, fiddler crab is going to pick. So that actually are things, those are things that kind of throw wrenches into calculating population genetics or things to think about in evolution.